The 502nd Heavy Panzer Battalion made history as the first German unit to field the formidable Tiger I tank during World War II. Deployed on the brutal Eastern Front, the battalion became one of Germany's most successful heavy tank units, credited with destroying 1,400 enemy tanks and 2,000 artillery pieces. Among its ranks was the legendary panzer ace Otokarius, whose exploits in battle became a symbol of the battalion's fearsome reputation. After battling fiercely at Narva, from February to April 1944, the 502nd was thrust into the brutal fighting at Pleska in April and May. By July, the battalion found itself defending the strategic town of Duneburg, or Daugavpils, in Latvia, as the Soviet offensive pushed westward. It was here, at Daugavpils, that the 502nd would face its toughest battle yet, as the weight of the Soviet onslaught threatened to crush the battalion's last stand. By mid-July 1944, the Soviet juggernaut, Operation Bagration, had torn apart the German front in Belorussia. Over 300,000 German troops were either dead or captured, and the once mighty Army Group Center had been annihilated, leaving a gaping 250-mile hole in the German defenses. Tens of thousands of defeated soldiers trudged into Soviet captivity, facing a grim and uncertain future at the mercy of their vengeful captors. As the Soviet steamroller pressed west, toward Latvia, Estonia, and the heart of the fatherland, panic gripped the German ranks. The Latvian town of Daugavpils was a key crossroads, a lifeline for the German army's northern forces. If the Soviets seized it, Army Group North would be cut off, with disastrous consequences for the German war effort. Holding Daugavpils was crucial for the Germans, who frantically funneled reinforcements into the region. Boxcars rattled into the town and down to Termont in the south, packed with division after division of weary soldiers. The 16th Army's 2nd Army Corps received vital reinforcements from Army Group North's 18th Army. Along with fresh infantry, they were bolstered by assault guns, flak batteries, typically used against aircraft but now turned on ground targets, and heavy artillery battalions. The most formidable German fighting units at the 16th Army's disposal were the 502nd, 2nd and 3rd Companies, equipped with their colossal Tiger tanks. These heavy hitters arrived between July 4th and 6th, poised to take on the Soviet advance with their unmatched firepower and thick armor. The crew set up camp, waiting for the engineers to reinforce bridges strong enough to carry their 56-ton machines. As the Soviets closed in, these Tigers would soon face one of their greatest challenges. The first clashes for Daugavpils erupted in the scattered villages nestled among the hills, lakes, and marshy terrain to the east and south of the town. Along the southern bank of the Dvina River, it was the 132nd Infantry Division that bore the brunt of the initial assault by the Soviet 6th Guards Army. In an instant, the infantrymen dropped to the ground, as Soviet and German submachine guns roared at near point-blank range. Grenades flew through the air from both sides, exploding with deadly force. Unseen by the Soviets, two 20mm German flak guns crept into position in the woods behind the pinned-down Germans. Their rounds cracked through the air, snapping just above the soldiers' heads. The overwhelming firepower was too much for the Soviets. 100 of them scattered in panic and forced to retreat. On July 9th, at 1,000 hours, the Tiger Battalion received urgent orders to rush to the aid of the Infantry Division. 
The scorching midday sun beat down on the tigers, baking their steel hulls, as clouds of dust clogged their motors and ground down the running gears. Out of the 22 tigers that arrived, only eight were initially combat ready, though by midnight, repair crews had managed to get another four back into action. The tigers roared into action, smashing Soviet anti-tank guns and mortars, but the German infantry couldn't clear the forests, leaving the tigers exposed to Soviet close combat units. Due to this oversight, two tigers were knocked out, suffering hits to the commanders cupola and turret. The attack was forced to halt, as advancing through the woods without infantry support proved too dangerous for the tanks. Despite the setbacks, the Tigers held firm, silencing enemy guns and helping the infantry push back. The Tigers of the 502nd 2nd Company, commanded by Lt. Eichhorn, were thrust into the fray, tasked with covering the retreat of German grenadiers. Amidst the chaos, clouds of dust signaled the advance of Soviet tanks and trucks. Although the Tigers' high explosive shells wreaked havoc on Soviet infantry and artillery, a well-aimed anti-tank round disabled one of Eichhorn's Tigers. As the battle raged on July 12, the Soviets intensified their push, breaching the Dvina and advancing into Lithuania. General Andrei Yeremenko's 2nd Baltic Front joined the fray, putting immense pressure on Army Group North. Despite General Johannes Friesner's frantic calls for a withdrawal, Hitler's stubborn refusal left the German forces cut off and dangerously overstretched. On July 13, the 502nd, 2nd, and 3rd Companies continued their fierce defense, as Lt. Otto Karius's Tiger briefly captured the spotlight during a newsreel filming, earning fleeting fame amidst the chaos of battle. However, the Soviets kept up the pressure, using their infantry's infiltration skills and relentless tank assaults. On July 14, intense combat saw the Tigers hold their ground against overwhelming odds, while Soviet advances continued to shake the German lines. By July 15, with the Soviets slicing through German defenses, Lt. Karius spearheaded a counterattack only to face a punishing Soviet artillery barrage that forced a retreat. Despite heroic efforts and notable successes in holding and recapturing positions, the Tigers suffered significant losses and the Soviet advance persisted. The German counterattacks on July 18, involving the 81st Infantry Division and additional support, struggled against well-entrenched Soviet anti-tank defenses. While the Tigers achieved some notable gains, the overall impact of the counterattacks remained limited. Nonetheless, the steadfast German defensive efforts, reinforced by the formidable Tigers of the 502nd, succeeded in stalling the relentless Soviet advance. Over two weeks of intense fighting, the Tigers claimed significant kills, including 63 anti-tank guns and 11 tanks, but the battle was far from over. As the first round of the struggle for Daugov Peels ended on July 21st, preparations for the second round began. At 0 100 hours on July 22, 1944, the 502nd Heavy Panzer Battalion received an urgent radio message from 2nd Corps. The situation was dire. Soviet armored formations had smashed through Major General Hanke's 290th Infantry Division on the northern bank of the Dvina River. The retreating German troops were falling back toward Izalta, worn down and demoralized. One soldier's diary entry captured the grim reality. We are exhausted. One cannot recognize another. Over the tanned, 
dusty faces are sweat-encrusted furrows. Stubby beards are pasted with sweat and dirt. We haven't slept for days, the dust burns in our throats. No one speaks. As dawn approached, the threat loomed larger. Reports from terrified infantrymen spoke of up to 100 Soviet tanks advancing in force. German General von Melanthin depicted the Soviet tanks and tactics during this phase as a keenly edged tool handled by daring and capable commanders, marking them as the most formidable offensive force of the war. In response, the Germans mobilized every available anti-tank gun, assault gun, flak unit, and Tiger tank. As the sun rose, the stage was set for an epic encounter between the German defenders and the overwhelming Soviet attackers. The 502nd's first company, under Lieutenant Eichhorn, was the first to respond. At 0500 hours, Eichhorn, commanding four Tigers, arrived northeast of Daugavpils and proceeded to Azalta for reconnaissance and coordination with the 290th. An hour later, Lieutenant Hans Bolter, a Knight's Cross holder, followed with six additional Tigers, engaging and destroying six Soviet T-34s, several anti-tank guns, and supply trucks. Despite their success, two of Bolter's Tigers were lost. At 0800 hours, Lieutenant Otto Karius of the 2nd Company arrived to find Bolter already engaged in the thick of battle. Upon assessing the deteriorating situation, Karius wasted no time and made his way to Azalta. As his Tigers took a brief respite from the scorching sun, Karius and Staff Sergeant Albert Kirscher embarked on reconnaissance. They encountered a chaotic scene of retreating German forces and panicked troops fleeing to Daugavpils. Amidst the uproar, they discovered a corporal in a ditch, who warned of Soviet tanks advancing into the next village. With the situation growing increasingly dire, the 502nd's Tigers readied for the pivotal clash that would determine the fate of Daugavpils. As the sun rose, Lieutenant Karius and his team approached the village of Malinava. A lieutenant on a motorcycle raced in from the south, delivering grim news. An assault gun battalion was encircled north of the village, and attempts to break through had already cost seven assault guns. He had slipped through Soviet lines seeking assistance from Daugavpils, but found no heavy weapons available. Disheartened, he was now returning empty-handed. In a bid to lift his spirits, Lieutenant Karius assured him that he would return with his battalion within two hours. From a ridge overlooking the area, Karius observed two Soviet T-34-85 tanks stationed at the village's entrance, with more tanks advancing from the north. Determined to turn the tide, Karius quickly rallied his men. We are completely on our own, he declared. We have to get through this without losses, if at all possible. He devised a bold plan. Two tanks would charge into the village to surprise the enemy and prevent them from firing, while the remaining six tanks, led by Lieutenant Nienstedt, would provide support from a reverse slope. With urgency and resolve, Karius and his officers prepared for a critical assault, hoping their strategy and the patron saint of radios would bring them victory against the Soviet advance. Lieutenant Karius took Staff Sergeant Albert Kirscher aside to brief him on their upcoming operation. I'll lead, and both of us will advance to the center of the village as quickly as possible, Karius instructed. You'll cover our rear while I focus on the front. We need to get our bearings swiftly and neutralize any threats we encounter. I expect at least one company of Soviets in the village, unless more reinforcements have arrived. 
Macarius and Kersher then stormed into the village of Malanava in their tigers, engines roaring and weapons ready. The surprise attack caught the Soviet defenders off guard. As Karius rushed into the village, Kersher's tigers swiftly engaged, knocking out two Soviet T-34s with precise fire. Spotting a Soviet Joseph Stalin tank, Karius fired, setting it ablaze. For the next 15 minutes, the two tigers unleashed devastation on the village, where Soviet troops, caught in disarray, fell victim to the onslaught. Karius's radio orders to Lieutenant Nienstedt ensured no Soviet tanks escaped. By the time Karius reported back, he had claimed 17 Joseph Stalins and 5 T-34s. The assault gun battalion, saved by Karius's daring action, was freed and prepared to escort the wounded and prisoners to Daugavpils. After the fierce battle at Malanava, Lt. Karius and the 2nd Company advanced east to Barsuki. By 1700 hours, Karius had scouted fresh Soviet tank tracks and found a perfect ambush site. The Tigers forded a muddy creek, but one tank got stuck, leaving two behind. The remaining six Tigers took up hidden positions behind a rise, camouflaged and poised to strike. As dusk approached, dust clouds signaled the arrival of the Soviet convoy. Karius and his men waited, watching as the Soviet tanks, infantry, and supply trucks moved into view. When the lead tank neared the ambush point, the Tigers unleashed their devastating fire. The 88mm guns roared to life, tearing through Soviet tanks and trucks with deadly precision. The ambush was a nightmare for the Soviets. Tanks exploded, trucks collided, and the infantry, paralyzed by fear, fled in chaos. As Karius stood amidst the chaos, he felt a grim satisfaction wash over him, while the sky darkened with thick smoke and the remnants of burning wreckage surrounded him. In the end, 28 Soviet tanks and numerous vehicles were destroyed, delivering a powerful blow that left the Soviets with much to ponder. However, Lt. Karius's dramatic recounting of his July 22nd attack on Malanava and subsequent ambush near Barsuki, as detailed in his memoirs, faces scrutiny. Karius claimed to have destroyed 23 Soviet tanks, including heavy Joseph Stalin models, but Major Schwanner's after-action report, also featured in Karius' biography, Tigers in the Mud, contradicts this. Schwanner documented 17 tanks destroyed, 10 by Karius, and noted three escapes, mostly T-34s rather than Stalins. Soviet records, confirmed by the 5th Tank Corps, reported losses of 10 T-34s and 5 Joseph Stalin IIs but these were said to have occurred around Malanovo rather than Malanava. Furthermore, Schwanner's report fails to mention the ambush Karius described, and there is no record of a 1st Tank Brigade Joseph Stalin existing at that time. While Soviet accounts often downplayed their losses, German claims were also prone to exaggeration due to propaganda and battlefield chaos. Karius may have conflated details or dates from his numerous battles, leading to inconsistencies in his vivid but disputed war stories. Despite Karius's remarkable success, the Soviet advance continued unabated. On July 23rd, artillery barrage cleared the path for Soviet tanks and infantry. By the 24th, the second company faced a split in its ranks. Lieutenant Nienstedt commanded six Tigers at Kravani, while Karius led four Tigers toward Kokoniski. As Soviet forces breached German lines, Nienstedt quickly mobilized, racing to the rescue with just his Tiger and one additional tank. 
Facing an overwhelming force of 20 Soviet tanks, Nienstedt managed to knock out 10 on his own, with his companion Tiger accounting for another 7. A subsequent counterattack, involving all 6 Tigers and the 44th Engineer Battalion, succeeded in retaking the German positions, though the battle raged on with no end in sight. While Lt. Nienstedt celebrated a triumphant day, Lt. Otto Karius faced a near-fatal encounter. Stranded without his Kubel wagon, Karius was scouting ahead on a motorcycle when gunfire erupted from a nearby farmhouse. Shot multiple times, Karius was on the brink of disaster but was saved by the timely arrival of Tigers from his own company. Rushed to safety, Karius made a remarkable recovery, went on to command the new Yag Tigers, and earned the oak leaves to his Knight's Cross for his impressive combat achievements. After Karius' departure, the Tigers of the 502nd remained locked in fierce combat. On July 25th, despite his injuries, Lt. Nienstedt pressed on, aiding the 503rd Grenadier Regiment in their attempt to retake Malanava, destroying two tanks and three anti-tank guns. Meanwhile, Lt. Eichhorn led a counterattack near Auskaliani, where his Tigers destroyed 16 Soviet tanks in a close-range battle without losing any of their own. The fighting intensified on July 26, with Soviet forces mounting relentless assaults. Despite destroying 12 more tanks and an ISU-122, the Tigers suffered major losses. Two Tigers were destroyed, with one crew escaping unharmed, while three men from the 2nd Tigers crew were killed. Eichhorn, retreating under heavy fire, fought through a barrage of anti-tank guns. Although their armor held, the Tigers were rendered incapable of further combat after enduring intense damage. As Soviet pressure mounted, the German defense along the 2nd Corps front lines began to falter. With the 3rd Baltic Front joining the offensive against Army Group North, over 80 Soviet divisions relentlessly attacked the exhausted German forces who had been fighting for months. On July 26, the decision was made to abandon Daugov Peels, and by July 29, the Germans retreated, establishing temporary new front lines. However, the inevitable collapse came on August 1st, when the Soviet 1st Baltic Front reached the Gulf of Riga, cutting off 30 divisions of AGN in northern Latvia and Estonia. The 502nd Panzer Battalion met its demise during the fighting near Daugov Peels. According to Karius, only one Tiger reached the Dvina River, with surviving crew members forced to swim across after abandoning their tanks. The battalion never recovered from these losses, as their remaining tanks were lost piecemeal. Both Eichhorn and Nienstedt were wounded, replaced by less capable officers, marking the end of the battalion's effectiveness. Once the temporary resistance of the 502nd ended, the Soviet steamroller resumed its westward push, overwhelming German defenses and driving ever closer to the heartlands of the Reich.